Uh, we're going to start with uh, Harry, because Harry said he's, he's got to go as soon as he's spoken, unfortunately. Um, the title is uh, Mainstreaming Tobacco Harm Reduction, so it's a general talk about harm reduction. I just wanted to, to uh, open up with just a, cu a couple of points coming out from the last session. Um, one of my roles has been the author of the Global State Tobacco Harm Reduction Report, which has been kind of name-checked a fair bit already today, which is very gratifying. Um, I think it's important to point out, though, that, that there is a kind of um, misconception that it's an industry publication. And I think I do need to kind of make it clear that, yes, it was funded by the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. Um, but, the, the, A, they had no editorial input into it at all. And B, if you actually look at the main report, there are about 300 references in that report. And most of them, with the exception of two, um, are from independent, peer-reviewed, publicly available scientific and clinical studies. So it's wrong for anybody, a politician or a health minister or anyone like that, to dismiss the evidence in that report as, oh, it's just another report from the tobacco industry. There are two references in there. One was a set of photos of toxic emissions comparing e-cigarettes, cigarettes and fresh air. And they came from BAT. And they were the same photos that were used by the BBC in a documentary about e-cigarettes. As far as I'm aware, BBC is not in the pockets of big tobacco, last time I looked. Um, and there's also a, a very small reference um, to ICOS uh, emissions, which was accepted by the UK Commission on Toxicology, which investigated the relative safety of ICOS. And that was it. All other 298 references uh, are, are, have nothing to do with the industry at all. Second point is, um, I think this is probably about my fourth GFN, something like that. Um, and it's really interesting to see how the advocacy movement has grown over that period. With colleagues here from, from Africa and from Latin South America in particular. Um, people from Chile and Colombia and Nigeria and Malawi. Um, which is kind of very new and it's very noticeable in the, in the pack, the number of advocacy advertising leaflets that, that are in there now, that were never in there before. Okay, so um, I've got a number of sort of esteemed colleagues whose opinions I respect hugely that do kind of equate tobacco harm reduction with other sorts of what I would call health and safety initiatives like seat belts and crash helmets and, and those kinds of things which I call I call them health and safety. And it's true, it is a way of explaining harm reduction to people who don't understand what it is. But actually, and I think the tobacco advocacy movement demonstrates the point, my view of, of tobacco harm reduction in terms of mainstreaming is to link it very closely to the history of drugs and HIV harm reduction for two main reasons. One, um, drugs and HIV harm reduction were both bottom-up, grassroots, community actions undertaken by people who were completely marginalised and despised and hated by the, by the wider communities, the drug users, gay communities in New York and San Francisco uh, and elsewhere. And they took it upon themselves to do what they could to protect their own health. So I think it was the Dutch that, that began the first kind of what I call guerrilla public health, giving out uh, needles and syringes initially to try and combat uh, outbreaks of hepatitis uh, in, in parts of uh, in Amsterdam, Rotterdam and elsewhere. Um, so, and, and in exactly the same way, tobacco harm reduction advocacy, people that the original people who originally started vaping and originally produced the products had nothing to do with, certainly had nothing to do with big tobacco and had nothing to do with government public health. This has been very much a bottom-up movement. Um, and one just hopes that in the same way that governments 
some governments have come on board with HIV and drugs harm reduction. Still a lot of challenges left on that one. But, um, that governments will increasingly come on board with this as well. But like I say, drugs and harm reduction and HIV is still a struggle in many parts of the world. So um, in terms of tobacco harm reduction, it ain't going to be an easy ride, as I'm sure you've already discovered. The other important uh, linkage and the other important reason for trying to mainstream is that while adult smoking rates in a lot of countries have come down quite significantly to the UK, it's probably something like 14, 15%, many other countries is below 20%. When you look at people with serious drug and alcohol problems and mental health problems, their smoking rates are sky high. Their smoking rates are 60, 70% and, and more. Um, and so I think it is beholden on drug and HIV workers and alcohol workers working in treatment sectors to realise that they will be doing huge benefit to their own patients and clients health by embracing tobacco harm reduction. Um, one of the presentations I've done in the past shows a picture of a guy who's HIV positive who says that HIV didn't give me clogged arteries uh, and so and I've heard uh, somebody called Helen Redmond, who I'm sure you've, you've all heard speak before, say that you know she's been dealing with clients who, who managed to you know recover from heroin addiction, come out the other side, crack and the rest of it, still cannot give up the nicotine, still cannot give up the cigarettes. Uh, and so she was engaged in a small project to give out these cigarettes until she couldn't anymore because the money ran out, of course, as it always does. So those are my kind of sort of key messages really about linking drugs, HIV, and harm reduction and tobacco harm reduction as a, a means of bottom-up empowerment and people taking control of their own health as far as they possibly can. Okay, thanks, Harry. Uh, I, think got some, I think you've got some slides for us, can have we? Or are you still working on those? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Arthur Kambefetz. I am the chairman of NNA Sweden, and I also represent the Secretariat of INCO. Um, and I was asked to briefly speak about uh, the, the mainstreaming of, of THR in relation to other forms of harm reduction and other forms of human rights work that is going on. And I tried to put a few points together, but it's not really I'm can we have the next slide, please? That's okay. You can do it yourself over there. Can you do it? You can do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, we started talking to <coughs> vaping activists in the United States. And we tried to explain to them that it was probably a good idea if we could connect Swedish news, the Swedish experience, to the emergence of vaping. What we encountered, or what I encountered, was that there was this intense uh, feeling of that that would harm um, vaping. It would harm electronic cigarettes. It would connect them to something that they felt would harm their cause and their access to safer products. Uh, now, of course, that is, nobody talks about that anymore because it, every, it's obvious to almost all of us that tobacco harm reduction is a coherent category of different products fitting different people, different tastes that all provide the same functions, which is the, the benefits and the lower harms. I also wanted to go to the harm reduction conferences on drugs and meet the, the users, the scientists, the regulators and the WHO because there was, obviously there was a, a much larger acceptance there for the need, the urgent need of providing safer products to people who needed them. We haven't been able to do that until this year. So I was in Porto in, at the Harm Reduction 19 conference, Harm Reduction International, um, and it was, it, was, it was an amazing experience. You had the new chief 
from UNAIDS, speaking to 1,200 people that were scientists, regulators, organizations, NGOs, country representatives, and in the back we actually had two people in yellow vests that administered naloxone to a user from a user group who was not feeling too well. Which was, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. And then I think you see what happens when everybody speaks to everybody. So we would want to see the industry, the advocates, the scientists and the regulators all being in the same room speaking to each other, which we cannot do today. Um, so what, what, we, what I realized, or what we got confirmed when we were in Porto, is that um, there's, a, there's a black hole of lacking knowledge and understanding. So the harm reduction organizations in drugs and, and drugs and crime, basically, they are centered in Vienna. And they are now moving a large part of their focus to Geneva because getting the message across to the organizations in Vienna is not really going to help you materially unless it goes to Geneva and gets around the world. Um, we are hoping to, or we are already based in Geneva, so we are going to be on the Geneva Drug Platform Week starting in 10 days in Geneva and we are hoping to be able to connect Again, not just connected, but using what they have achieved in connecting the different groups, the stakeholders. We want to do the same thing, and we also would like to connect with them. So it's the drugs, it's the sex, it's the family planning, all of these different areas where the idea and the function that we are after with harm reduction is <coughs> equal. It's just different settings, but it's the same concept, it's the same principle, and those, that principle is enshrined in the fundamental human right. So, questions on that? And, and Harry, by the way, is a personal hero of mine for the work that he has done precisely in that other area that we are now, that we have now established connections with. Okay, thanks. When, when you say Geneva, is that code for the World Health Organization, or are you thinking of other entities in Geneva? Mainly the WHO, also the FCTC, and interestingly enough, the drug harm reduction people, professionals that I met in Porto, they assume that the FCTC work along the same ethical codes and rules as do the rest of the WHO. And they were surprised and a bit, you know, kind of, what? Where, where we explain that, no, 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 they don't speak to each other very much at all. The FCTC Secretariat speaks to tobacco control WHO people, not in Geneva as much as in the Philippines or in somewhere in Africa or somewhere else, or in Turkey, for example. Uh, I've got a question for both of you. Um, I might be wrong on this, but Harry can probably confirm. Um, I've heard organisations like I IRA, International Harm Reduction Association, is it, um, uh, are not too keen on uh, talking about harm reduction in the, in the sphere of tobacco. They, they understand harm reduction in other ways, but it's hard to get it on their agenda. Firstly, is that true? And secondly, do you think there's more appetite now, as I can, which you're talking about, the Porto people you're talking about. I mean, is it, is it the same thing? Is it, is it something we're going to find difficult to get across harm reduction advocates, or should they just naturally come on board? Um, they're now called Harm Reduction International now, change their name. Um, well, I, I think that um, it's a slow process. Um, but I think all of the people in the drugs world that I have had contact with of late, they kind of do get it. Um, it's quite interesting. I mean, there was a time when the human rights organisations like Amnesty um, wouldn't engage with drug harm reduction in relationship to uh, capital punishment in certain countries because it involved kind of drug users and drug traffickers. And they kept 
they want, didn't want to be, their organisations did not want to be associated with drugs. Eventually, they changed their mind. Um, and Amnesty and other similar human rights watch organisations now come on board campaigning against capital punishment wherever it is and for whatever reason. Um, and I was recently speaking in Lisbon a week before, either a week before, a week after actually, a week after your conference, to a small group of um, kind of Portuguese equivalent of the FDA and um, other academics and doctors in the room, including the people who run Portugal's very enlightened drug control policy, um, and explain to them about tobacco arm reduction, and they seem very uh, amenable to the idea. So I, I think it's always going to be a slow burn with these things, and, and there are some people who are going to, there will still be people who talk about, you know, the influence of tobacco and all the rest of it, and, and you know, it's all a big plot and all the rest of it. But I think the more enlightened people in, in those communities are, are definitely beginning to get it. I really don't know how to respond to that. Um, I've never seen you speechless before. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Don't have to. No, I think I'll pass on that. Uh, okay. Uh, is there any questions for uh, uh, yeah, Inga? I think the problem with Harm Reduction International is the donors, the ones who fund them. So that's the European Commission, World Health Organization, and many bodies that don't actually support tobacco harm reduction, that will look at harm reduction in other fields, but won't touch tobacco harm reduction. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's going to be very difficult to put it on the agenda. I, yes, I, w I would argue that you are correct. and. We had, or rather I had, discussions with, with Open Society many, many years ago. And they were very sympathetic to what we were trying to do and the science behind it, but said that it would materially harm their investments in drugs harm reduction to the extent that they wouldn't touch it. Um, so yes, there is still a lot of the funding that kind of nudges in certain directions. but human rights thinking in harm reduction is gaining traction with the people working. And it does create a cognitive dissonance in smart, ethical people to say that, that, that well, you deserve those rights, but you don't. So I'm optimistic, and I think it might actually be a little bit faster moving now that the focus is moving away from Vienna and moving to Geneva because the message has already, it's already struck home in Vienna. So now doing it in Geneva, I think the organizations and the people working will run into sort of a similar brick wall that, that we bang our heads against, and hopefully that will create a larger momentum. I'm hoping, and, and to the extent that we can influence that to happen, that is one of our objectives. Did you have to, did you want to say something? Um, very briefly. Um, I, I got contacted by the European Drug Monitoring Centre, EMCDDA, who ran the Lisbon Addictions Conference in October, and they were really rather keen on having a section on tobacco arm reduction. Um, so I submitted an abstract, which curiously they lost. Um, <laughs> um, but I have been assured that uh, when I send it in again, when I get home from this conference, it will be duly uh, taken into account. And the idea is to run a structured session involving some of the sorts of people that are in this conference to get, get across some messages about tobacco harm reduction. So we'll have to wait and see whether that actually happens or not. Okay, um, Harry's got to go immediately after this, so uh, we've got time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, John? Okay, um, I think it was David Sweener who, who mentioned this in the earlier panel discussion. I, I'm not quite sure because I was sitting on the floor over there and, and the podium was between me and the speakers. But he said that he'd learned a lot from the history of harm reduction in these other fields and HIV and pr persons who use drugs, for example. And um, in addition to this uh, approach that you're taking now, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on a lot of us in the safer nicotine field really don't know that history, or we know it in superficial levels. 
um, to think about what can we learn from that. When, when is a demonstration the right thing, a, a, pro, a protest? When does it backfire? What worked, what didn't work? Um, the, it's already been mentioned, the kind of quasi or even illegal need, needle exchange programs that were then proven to be you know, not luring children into <coughs> heroin use. Um, how, how do we how do we do a little bit better job of learning from that history? And it's a 30-year history. Well, I, the risk of sounding facetious, nicotine isn't dangerous enough. Uh, in, <laughs> in terms of what happened in the in the UK, um, uh, uh, some drug workers and, and uh, health professionals went to hear a presentation by Glenn Margot, who was head of HIV, uh, public health services in San Francisco at the beginning of the HIV epidemic. Um, and they spoke to him afterwards and, and they said, he said, if there's one thing you could have done in San Francisco that you didn't do, what would it have been? And he said, needle exchange. And what happened in the UK was that the health professionals um, worked up the political chain right up, right up to Margaret Thatcher's cabinet level. Essentially, put the fear of God into them that they, if they didn't actually do something about to try and prevent the spread of HIV, forget you just say no drugs, abstinence, and all of that. There was a risk that they would infect all of us, and that definitely was a tipping point and switched politicians on to not necessarily originally endorsing needle exchange, but they certainly didn't stop it, and eventually the funding was made available for it to happen. Um, and so I think that there is, an, any, any, I think in the Quran there's something that says um, you can do a lesser evil if it prevents a greater evil. And that allowed for methadone to needle exchange in a country like Iran, which you would never imagine would happen. I don't quite know what the history of all of that eventually mapped out to be. Um, but there, there is this, this and, and maybe you can use the same sort of philosophy in relationship to, yes, yes, nicotine is addictive, but hey, look, look what a nicotine-only product that's not combustible can do to save lives. And also health economics as well, because a, another factor it was the, the fact that if you got people into treatment because you changed your drug policy, and because you were giving out needle exchange, you got people into treatment and your crime rates fell. Far less acquisitive crime because people were in treatment. So it was like for every, something like for every pound you spent on treatment, you saved three pounds in policing and criminal justice. So if you could find a way of doing a similar metric for health economics, the amount of money you would save by making sure all smokers were given free e-cigarettes or something, I mean, you know, that's going way out, but if you could do that sum and say how much money you would spend in a health system, um, that that might be an interesting calculation to do. Difficult when many governments are addicted to tobacco sin taxes. <clears throat> indeed, indeed, and they're not, they were never addicted to heroin income. <laughs> no, I, if I could just add to that, and INCO has, I mean, we are hoping to be able to collect information and learn from these organizations that we previously didn't have any daily or weekly contact with because they were playing their side of the field and we were doing our thing over here. Um, <coughs> if, if we can meet up uh, under the Geneva platform, as it's called, um, we hope that we can capitalize on their knowledge and collect that. because and. I do think we can provide a value for them as well because their body bags are much, much faster and more urgent than ours. But we have many, many, many more body bags than they do. So it, it, it's, it's silly to speak about a synergy or a benefit, but actually that's what we could possibly be looking at. Okay, thank you. I think we'll have to wrap it up there. And, um but thanks very much, Ratican and Harry. Um, can you give them a round of applause for? for the